the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Well, this should be a familiar day to you. Peace to the presentation of our Lord in the temple, also known as Candlemas, with the exception that we don't have the scouts with us this year, right. which has been postponed to the end of this month. But many of the other common features of this feast are still present. We will be doing as we have done in years past, since I've been here at least, we will do uh, the blessing of the candles for Candlemas and the blessing of throats. Now, as those of you who were here last week undoubtedly noted with the exotic, old-fashioned ceremonies and rituals that I bring into the church from the great Catholic tradition, this too, like the blessing of the doorway for Epiphany, with the initials of the wise men to protect the house over the coming year, these two ceremonies are traditions of the church that convey deep truths about the mystery of the incarnation and the mysteries that we celebrate during the season of Epiphany. Now, this is going to be a little quiz for those of you who have gone through this before, because of course, remember that we have had some interruption in our normal liturgical life because of this little pandemic that we've had over the last couple of years. So the first reading from the Gospel of Luke is the story of Jesus's presentation in the temple. So what does that mean? the presentation of our Lord in the temple? This is a good confirmation question if the bishop comes and quizzes you. Feast of the presentation. What is the whole point of the presentation? Well, they had to take the baby back to the temple. Yes, and why is that, Carol? And the, what, the purification, was it for the mother or the baby? Well, now that's a good question. It's actually a little bit from column A, a little bit from column B. So the tradition about the mother is that for a time after menstruation or childbirth, the mother was expected to remain apart from the community until a certain amount of time had passed, right? What we call sort of purification, and then would be admitted back into the temple, right? Because there were all these rules in the temple about cleanness or uncleanness or holiness or unholiness, right? And we can argue about the rightness of that. Of course, rules were made largely by men. And so, of course, Father Ethan takes great exception to some of these things that stigmatize the natural functions of the human body, particularly women's bodies. But all of that aside, <laughs> all of that aside, I will try to take I don't see the child born. It's a messy business. <laughs> it is a messy business. Yes, it is a messy business. But then we could say that about life in general. Life is a messy business for men, women, and those who identify differently, life is a messy <laughs> business. And we did in the prayer book, and this is a blast from the past, we'll go back to the Wayback Machine, right? For those of you who are a bit older, you will remember that there is a little place in the prayer book for this type of spirituality. Does anybody remember what the little ritual in the prayer book was called? We don't have it in the churching of women. The churching oh, yeah. of women. Yeah. Wow. yeah. The churching yeah. of women. You get a gold star, Ron Fox. <laughs> you get a gold star. Yes, the churching of women. And now we have a ceremony in the prayer book called Thanksgiving for the blast of, for the birth or adoption of a child. So we have sort of modernized our thinking about how to mark what is indeed a very important part of the cycle of life, right? The cycle of our biological life and the cycle of the church's life, right? Yeah. And so we have that part called the churching of women in the old prayer book, and now we consider oh. it uh, the blessing, uh, Thanksgiving for the birth or adoption of a child, in which there are blessings for the parents as well as for the child, right? But then there's also the part about the child. So what's going on with the presentation of the child? And this is more of a church history sort of question, or a biblical history sort of question. What's about the presentation of the child? What's well, fulfilling the old, the old the tradition of a, having him become a part of the church and for the people, oh yeah, with your temple, yeah. Temple, the people. Right. Uh, there is a line in the beginning of the script, in the beginning of the uh, gospel passage. Every firstborn male shall be designated as holy to the Lord, right? Yes. What about all the other ones? They're just kind of bad. No. 
No, that is not what that is about. <laughs> but that's a great question. No, actually what it has to do with is you will remember that in the Old Testament, the firstborn child was supposed to be dedicated to as priests to the Lord, right? But the, tri but the, but the tribe, um, Aaron's descendants, right, were corrupted, right, because of uh, transgressions against the Lord. And so it devolved upon the tribe of Levi to be the priests for the Israelites, right? And so what happened was those, so the firstborn were, had to be redeemed, right, from the obligation of serving as priests in the temple, which would have fallen upon the first born. And instead, it's the tribe of Levi that fulfills that role in the Israelite society. So it's kind of a reminder of an old custom around the first born that changed over time, right? It's a reminder of both the ways that the people had failed God by being unfaithful, but also God also making provision for the priesthood within Israelite society. So Jesus, as the firstborn of Mary and Joseph, did kind of what the customs were and went to the temple to be sort of presented and, and redeemed from service in the temple by the gift of the pair of turtle doves and the two young pigeons. Was right? this before or after the child was circumcised? That, uh, so the feast of the circumcision, right, right is, is after that. Okay. Or, or the piece of the circumcision comes before this. Sorry. Oh, okay. Right? Okay. Right? Because remember, piece of the circumcision, January 1. Right? So they had to bring baby circumcised, baby, baby circumcised first, right? Bloodletting. Remember, I preached about that the bloodletting at the beginning of Jesus' life and the bloodletting at the end of his life, right? The crucifixion. And then we have the presentation in the temple. And in this way, Jesus is not special. In this way, Jesus shows. Jesus is belonging continuity with the Israelite tradition by his parents bringing him to the temple and doing what, what all parents did with their firstborn sons, right? So we have this way in which Jesus is showing in the early moments of his life that Jesus came not to overturn the law, but to fulfill it, right? As Jesus would promise as an adult. And as a child, Jesus was part of that, right? Jesus was starting on that path. And his parents were very faithful enough. So we do the Feast of the Presentation as a reminder of Jesus being exempted from this normal duty of firstborn sons, but and yet we have in the letter to the Hebrews something very different. Jesus might have been exempted from the old priesthood, but now he's the great high priest that, that takes the place of the old priesthood, right? And so we have this reading from Hebrews that's kind of like he's, he's being exempted from one sort of role and yet entering into a brand new and greater role, which is the great high priest for all humanity, right? And that's, what, that's a big theme in the letter to the Hebrews, right? It has a very high theology in the letter to the Hebrews. And the notion is, is that Jesus came to be a priest that would take away all the obligations of, of former uh, temple ritual, right? would sort of not bring it to fulfillment, bring it to completion, not replace it necessarily, but just kind of bring it to its natural end and replace it with something new. See, the Lord says, I'm doing something new, right? Right. We don't put new wine into old wineskins, right? All of those images of renewal are really important. They come to fruition here. So what we have in, this, in these readings is this recognition that Jesus is both providing continuity with the old tradition and doing something really new. That, that reading from Malachi is important. Does anybody know why Malachi is important? Why is Malachi important? And this is a general ordination exam question. Let's see if you can pass it. There is a reason that Malachi appears as the last book of the Hebrew Bible in the Christian, in the Old Testament, right? In the Christian scriptures. Seems to me he's predicting that uh, Jesus is coming. You got it. Perfect. A plus. Perfect. So Malachi is that connection point, right? Malachi, in the ordering of the books in the Hebrew Bible and the Jewish tradition, does not appear there at the very end, right? The books are in a different order, sequenced differently for different reasons, because the Jewish preoccupation is with chronology, right? 
like the beginning of, the, of creation all the way through the repatriation of the Israelites back into their homeland after the Babylonian exile, right? And the Christians, on the other hand, are looking for this pivot point, right? This place where the covenant of the past, God's original covenant with the Israelites, transitions into the new covenant through Jesus, right? And Malachi is that book that bridges the Old Testament and the New Testament. And so what we have in this reading from Malachi is this notion of the purification of what had come before. And that isn't that really just a continuity, a continuation? Doesn't that also speak to continuity, to renewal? He's not throwing it away. Jesus is actually fulfilling by purifying, by renewing that which he inherited from the prophets of old and, and passing it on to us to his children of later generations in the church. Now, one of the things that we also do this day is we bless thirds. We bless candles, right? And we bless thirds. Why do we do these things? Why do we do these things? That's that piece is really on the third of it used to be on the third of it. Yes. So I don't know whose piece it was, but there was a story that was written about. Some child getting a fishbowl and stuff in his throat. And oh my God, Carol! Same blaze. A plus. Same blaze. A plus. Oh, your Catholic upbringing is done with <laughs> oh, Yes. And your memory is so good. Yes. Yeah. I know. Thank you very so, much. I'm working on that. So February second. So February second <laughs> was a day in the church when the the church the candles to be used in the church's year, right, the coming year, would be blessed. In church, and people would take candles home, for example, for use in their private altars, right, throughout the year. And the notion, of course, was connecting these candles with Jesus, Jesus' purification. Why? Because Jesus is the light of the world. Jesus becomes revealed as the Messiah. All of the readings point to this, right? And so we have these, these glimpses throughout the season of Epiphany of that Jesus is more than just this child, more than just his promise, but it's this light coming into the world. And, you know, the, the candles that we light at Candlemas is very much like the Paschal candle that we light at the Great Vigil of Easter, right? That light in the darkness. And then we have the Feast of St. Blaise, the Blessing of Throats, which, of course, is the day after Candlemas. And we use candles, bless the Candlemas to bless the throats of the congregation. Now, it is, I think, wonderful coincidence, a little spooky, that Ethan, Father Ethan had a throat infection this week. Oh, and when I, I really did, I really, throat infection this week, and went to the doctor, and they're like, yeah, it's something viral. Okay, fine. Uh, but I think, well, this year, I really need the blessing of the throat. I really do need that. And the story goes that there was a child uh, on, who that St. Blaise met on his, on his uh, travels and uh, extracted the fish bone from his throat. And so St. Blaise, you know, this developed this lovely medieval tradition of blessing throats. And the way it evolved within the church, it started out, of course, as many saints, uh, feasts, and, and rituals do as a local custom. But then it took on sort of relevance, relevance to the entire church. And the reason is, of course, that people saw in that ceremony a, a usefulness, right? We're at the beginning of the year, and we are asking not only for St. Blaise or, or God through St. Blaise to bless our thirst, but to bless all of us, to, to offer health and security for the, for the coming year, which is exactly the same sort of spirituality as marking the doorpost of our home for safety and protection for the coming year. So we have these rituals of the church that really do help us to kind of start the new year off right, right? Asking for God's protection of our homes, asking for God's protection of our bodies, right? And the season of Epiphany is a season in which we identify Jesus, Jesus's potential to heal and to make whole. And those readings that we have today are very good evidence of that, right? Bringing that the Old Testament prophets' predictions and promises to fulfillment, but also not just doing the same old, same old, but doing something really new, taking the best of the traditions of, of, of his faith and making it something new so that it may remain timely and relevant for future generations. And that's the genius of the church, is that we do that all the time. 
we don't just do same old, same old all the time. We bring even these old medieval and ancient customs into the church because they have continued relevance and we do something new with them. We make them relevant by contextualizing in a particular community, right? And that's what we've done here. And that's what we'll continue to do is we will bring these traditions into the church, reflect upon our scriptures, and then ask ourselves, what do these mean for our lives as Christians? How is God then calling us to go out into the world to make the world a safer place and then make other people? Amen. Amen. Amen.